how special is your little boy? Very special. One in two million, that's how special. Literally one in two million. And born on Australia Day, he just gets more special every year. Careful. Very slow, very slow. Zach Armstrong is an Aussie battler. Is that high enough? What? Seven high years enough? old, and for much of his short life, his little body has been fighting a disease with a very big name. It's known as FOP, or FOP. When Zach first got diagnosed, we used to say to him, you, do you know what FOP is? And he'd go, no, because he was only two. And we'd say to him, you grow bones. And you grow bones, which are normal bones, but in the wrong spots. Of the seven billion people who live on Earth, only 800 have this rare disease, and only eight in Australia. A world away in a small town in Scotland. <laughs> Careful, and you cut yourself. 19-year-old Louise Wedderburn is baking with her mum. Neither of Louise's arms can bend. Her knees are stiff. Her spine, locked. Basically, it is where your connective tissues and your muscles and everything slowly, gradually turn to bone. Yeah. Because FOP slowly stiffens the bodies of sufferers, they begin to resemble mannequins, which is why it is sometimes known as the human mannequin disease. There's no cure, and most will be in a wheelchair by the time they're 30. With each passing day, life becomes harder. I can still do everything I want to do, but just in a, sometimes in a different way than everybody else. You've called it the master key to the skeleton. It is the master key to the skeleton because this one mutation, this one genetic change, this one letter change out of six billion in our entire genome allows the body to uh, turn one organ system into another. And so here is a trapdoor in evolution, so to speak, where the body could, if it wanted to, create one organ system out of another. Lauren, tell me what Zach was like as a baby. Pretty much a normal baby. A very happy baby, never cried, never complained, never whinged, a joy. I had an easy ride. <laughs> Socks. The only thing out of the ordinary was little Zach's big toes. Because so many doctors have no knowledge of the disease, they miss this simple sign that gives it away. Zach went undiagnosed, then later was misdiagnosed. When he was 18 months, his mum, Lauren, took him to the doctor with swollen eyes. She was told it was an infection. With this infection, they gave us a course of antibiotics and more or less sent us home after the treatment. And then from there, it got worse. A biopsy was ordered, and that was the worst possible thing. FOP reacts to any kind of trauma by turning nearby muscles or tendons to bone. The biopsy needle kicked the disease into overdrive. Zach's mum could only watch helplessly as his body went from normal to abnormal in rapid time. It would change every five minutes. It looked like something was moving under his skin. It was amazing. It was, I've never seen anything like it. It was just very, very aggressive. It just got worse for Zach. When he was four, the disease caused his jaw to dislocate. Doctors operated, and during the surgery, Zach stopped breathing. He was given an emergency tracheotomy, putting a breathing tube in his throat. You want a suction? Can we quickly, sorry guys. But again, his disease reacted violently, growing new bones that locked up his vocal cords. The vocal boy in this video was left voiceless. How do you explain all of this to Zach? Um, he used to say, why don't I talk anymore? 
He doesn't like hearing his voice on videos anymore. He doesn't look back. He just keeps going. He moves forward. That was then. This is now. This is what I want to do now. Morning, and what Zach wants to do more than anything yeah, is to be like any other seven-year-old. You love all the Lego? Wow, look at that. So mum's put him in a regular school, in a normal grade one class. Where did you get it from? Here we go. You can show them the pictures where you got it from. Zach communicates with his teachers and classmates by making sounds. You're making it? All mouthing words. Is that a bus? Yeah, oh, the V-Dub. How proud are you when you see him do his little show and tells and use the iPad? <sighs> Love it. Zach, have you got that, 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 and that? Do you wish you had it? Would you like it? Yeah. What did you say? Oh, you'd like the car. Oh, Turn yeah. it around and show everyone which one you would like. We never thought he'd make it preschool. We never thought he'd make it to school. To watch him go from being ventilated on a machine to learning to walk, to communicate. Got told he'd never speak again, never eat again. Had three months of rehab on trying to walk and to go and start school and all these things, just amazing. Zach's misdiagnosis and subsequent mistreatment has accelerated his disease. Eventually, his bones will suffocate his heart and lungs. The average life expectancy is 41, but no one knows how much time Zach has. There are some hard days, though. <laughs> A lot of hard days. I've never cried. <laughs> Even when Zach was diagnosed. Sorry. Don't ever be sorry. We have seen a very beautiful, happy boy. Oh, he's amazing. He really is. Do you ever think, why us? Never. I never ever ask myself, why me? It's my fault. Why did I get this child? Never. I'm glad he's mine. I wouldn't want anyone else to have him. I really wouldn't. And that's the truth. I've never ever, ever asked. Just got on and done it. Had to. It's like she was given to us because the new that she would be looked after. I just always think, well, we are the lucky ones to have her, so. I didn't have a problem having her or anything, but uh, when she was born, her big toes were um, smaller. So growing up, were there any specific moments when it really hit you as to what was happening to your body? Because it was actually happening to me, like I didn't really like realize it as such. But like obviously I realized some things, like when this arm locked, but it wasn't like a big, like my arms locked. Like what am I going to do? I just kind of got on with it. That's been Louise's attitude all her life. And have a look and see if there's anything to wear. She strives to be independent, but it's difficult. To see that she's walking like so slowly and like I always say it, Lara says you're like a snail. <laughs> I think a snail's maybe faster than her. Yeah. It's a great jacket. I know it is. I think I've actually got the grey one in this. Oh, have you? <laughs> yeah. Little things are hard, like getting out of bed. Her sister has to help. Or getting in the car. Her mum lends a hand, or making a cake. Yet whatever the difficulty, Louise is determined to work through it. And mum is always there beside her. She said she wouldn't know what to do without you.
<laughs> I'm just thinking. <laughs> uh, probably nobody else would put up with her. <laughs> I would say she's a rascal. Mm. <laughs> she's a rascal, right enough. Do you remember the first time that you saw a child suffering from FOP? Oh, absolutely. I, I sure do remember that time. The day I saw a child with FOP was the most uh, um, emotional moment in my entire career. I, I realized uh, here was a condition that basically nobody was working on. So these are the faces that keep you going. They are. They do. They do. When I when I walk down this hallway before going into the lab, I know exactly why we're doing what we're doing. It is very interesting. At the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Fred Kaplan and his team have spent a quarter of a century studying this mysterious disease. We did a study and we found that 90% of patients were misdiagnosed worldwide. And Dr. Kaplan, who's never charged an FOP patient, is quietly confident they're close to a cure. They've identified the mutant gene. Now they're working on how to turn it off. And just as exciting would be the ability to activate the gene, to turn it on and grow new bones. Solve that secret and the treatments would follow for osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, bone cancer. They could help prevent heart disease, heal fractures quicker, even help regrow missing bones. So that it can be used to create bone for people who desperately need new bone, like children who uh, are born without certain bones, people who lose bones in accidents, and people who don't heal their fractures, people who need spine fusions, for example. Are you confident that you'll beat this disease? Oh, I'm confident that this disease will be beat, yes, and I am confident we'll, we'll get there. I just want to get there soon enough that it makes a difference for the children who are now here. One day, five years' time, if the phone and say it's working, everything's good, perfect. And if it works for Louise, well, that's even better. I have to keep going. <laughs> um, I never want to let this stop me from doing what I want to do. Louise and Zach are tough and special people. Despite the damage their bones are doing to their bodies, their spirit remains unbreakable. He's a life wire, this one. <laughs> what has Zach taught you about life? That we're strong, that you could do anything you want. To watch a little boy get up every day and enjoy life and want to play and experience every day. I've got nothing to complain about. You know, he's, he's the one that's going through it and he teaches us. I've been Harry since I was little. It never goes away. Sometimes they call me monkey, sometimes they call me spider monkey. Under all this hair is an 11-year-old girl. She was born with one of the rarest genetic conditions on Earth. It's called Ambras Syndrome. Do you ever ask yourself, why me? I used to ask myself why I was born this way. Because I used to it, I don't feel angry or afraid anymore. Locked inside this little girl is a genetic accident that scientists are trying to understand. Solving the mystery will make a difference to the lives of people all over the world. A possible cure for baldness. We hope that we can find out which genes can be turned on for making hair grow or to make hair not grow. Bangkok is home to 25 million people. But in this city of so many, 
one little girl stands out. Her name is Supatra, but friends call her Nat. Hello. Tim. <laughs> Nat lives with her mum, dad and sister, one hour's drive from the centre of Bangkok. She's literally one in a billion. Tell me a little bit about the condition that you have. There's something wrong in my cells. That's why I was born this way. I didn't have any choice. Nat's condition is commonly referred to as werewolf syndrome. Excessive hair grows all over her body, but mainly on her face. Sometimes my hair is soft, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it makes me famous. Nat has been this way since she was born. What went through your mind when you held her for the first time? I love her very much. I am crying because I am sorry for my baby. I usually feel upset when someone asks me about her condition. Since the Middle Ages, there have been fewer than 50 documented cases of werewolf syndrome. Those afflicted with the mutation often gained fame as freak show exhibits. Did you ever consider keeping her inside to protect her from being bullied? At first I thought about that, but then I realized that I could not possibly keep her from people's eyes forever. Someday people will see and will talk, so I take her everywhere. When Nat was younger, her parents tried laser treatment to remove the hair from her face. It caused painful bruising and the hair quickly grew back. So now it's allowed to grow. I cut it myself about once a month because it grows faster than normal. At first, Nat was the victim of name calling at school. She chose to ignore it. Now, the stairs have gone. Nat has a lot of friends. And she does everything they do. She's immersed herself in life. We usually told her that she can't choose the way she was born. She has to embrace it to her benefit. OK, how long? But at the USC Institute for Genetic Medicine in Los Angeles, there's now hope for this rarest of conditions. When you think about the world of six to seven billion people, and then just to have just a few people affected with this, it's a pretty rare mutation. Genetic scientist Dr. Pragna Patel, who has been studying Ambra syndrome for nearly 20 years, is on the verge of a breakthrough. It appears that some gene is inappropriately being either turned on or turned off. A few months ago, Dr. Patel, working with scientists in China, discovered the gene mutation that causes Nat's condition. The next step is to find a way of turning it off, or with baldness, turning it on. I get lots of letters from bald men who want me to find a cure for it. Dr. Patel can't give a time frame, but she's getting closer to developing a pill or a cream that restores hair. But her biggest goal is to find a cure for just one person. In the meantime, she believes there's a lot we can learn from Nat and others like her. There's a lot that these people have to teach other people about life, you know. We just imagine how, what they have to live with every day uh, and, uh, you know, cope with all the things that they have to cope with. So they, I think they have a lot to teach us. Hey, Nat. Nat knows better than anyone what it means to be different. And because of that, more than a cure, she wants people to embrace the differences in all of us. I'm proud of myself and the way I am. <laughs>
Kayla. I was about three when the family noticed something was wrong. So I kept eating and eating on my birthday party. I was the only one left start sitting down eating. They told us when she was diagnosed at four, she'd eat herself to death by the time she was 20. Katie Williams is now 31 and forever hungry. We're always eating, never stay full for long. Katie was born with a rare genetic condition called prader willi syndrome. If I get too big, then I could die. It compels her to eat constantly and never feel full. If Katie was given complete freedom, yes. what would happen? She would eat herself to death. We knew there was something wrong with her the moment she was born. Um, she was an emergency caesarean, and then she was whipped off, straight off to intensive care. So we knew right from the word go there was a, a major problem with Katie. And they told us in the first day or two that she'd be a vegetable. She's, you know, just completely obsessed by food. From nursery age, Every drawing, every painting, every piece of work, every story, all had food in it. They would all, whatever the teddy bears were doing, they'd have a picnic. I'll hold your leggy up for you. How capable is Kate of controlling her own weight? Not capable. <laughs> it's not there, that bit that tells you no, that bit that stops you, is missing. It's just not there. I'm trying to, I can't think of an analogy of what it's like. It's like asking you to stop breathing or stop going to sleep at night. It's just completely a natural instinct. The, the, the bit that governs it, the bit that would say no, isn't there. Prader Will is an unfortunate thing that happened. Uh, it could have happened to someone else. It happened to Katie. The syndrome was given a name in 1956, but long before that, it was documented in Renaissance paintings. When a baby with Prada Willy is conceived, the 15th chromosome is damaged or missing. It affects the part of the brain that controls hunger. The result, a constant, uncontrollable urge to eat. Sometimes I feel like two people, the good and the bad. There's so many things that I can't have, but I do love crisps, chocolate, but my daily allowance is 1,300. And there are far too many calories that I'm allowed per day. But it's hard to resist chocolate and I do love dairy milk. Should you be having but then that? But um, no, I shouldn't be having it because it's high in calories. I can watch the struggle in her as she, she battles. Did you struggle at school? Yeah. <laughs> Were you bullied? Yeah, quite a lot, yeah. I was treated like a dustbin. Like others with Prada Willy, Katie has learning difficulties and is emotionally immature. Despite this, she's one of the few people with PWS to have a full-time job. She's a cleaner in a school for handicapped children. And when the kids have gone home, she dances like no one's watching. Another symptom of the cruel disorder is infertility. She would dearly love to be able to have a child. And even though I've brought her up from a toddler, knowing that she can never have children, 
I think that was probably one of the hardest things that she's ever had to deal with. Katie's parents are now divorced and share her care. She lives five days a week with her father and weekends with her mother. Yes, yeah, that'd be quite nice. It's yes. like living with somebody that's um, an addict. You got it? That ought to be your last because you've had quite a few now and you had the pairs as well. Her whole life is governed by um, when the next meal's coming and what she's going to eat for the next meal and she'll finish breakfast and she'll be talking about what she's going to have for lunch and then she'll finish lunch and she's already thinking about her evening meal. First time I've seen beef pink. And so you've got this balance the whole time between how much she can have but constantly waging the war with how much she'd like to have. If you had money, would then you...? I would go out and spend it on things that I can't normally eat, like chocolate and biscuits and cakes. Katie's money is managed carefully by her father. Have you ever stolen money from your dad? Yes. Quite a few. For food? Yes. She was slim. Might get to it, because I like that flavour. Well, they come in too. But unfortunately, we live in the real world, and the real world is full of food. I do like ice cream. And she has to battle with that every day. And I can't imagine, I can't imagine what it must be like to have that level of temptation to deal with. She is putting on weight slowly and surely, and it's beginning to affect her now. Everything that's been done physically to help her is not working. Every morning, Kate records her weight. How much do you weigh today? Today I weighed about 132 kilograms. Does that upset you? I do get down when my weight's high. I do tend to nibble because I'm a bit miserable or upset. And then it just goes round in the official circle. At Cambridge University... I'm just going to shut you in now. Katie is giving herself to science to find a cure for this complex disorder. People with Prada Willi syndrome don't feel pain in the same way. They don't have a vomit reflex. So she wouldn't be sick if she ate too much. So she can't have a stomach pan because her pain threshold isn't normal and a stomach pan could burst and people with Prada Willi syndrome wouldn't know that it had burst. And so we're, we're running out of options now and the weight is gradually swallowing, swallowing her up. I'm desperately would like to see her in some care. From the minute he walked out my front door and was on his own or was with someone else, I had no control. If it was summertime, there was fruit on trees, he'd climb the tree and eat most of the fruit on the tree. He'd go to supermarkets and go through the aisles, eat what he wanted and just leave. He would eat frozen mince, uh, frozen chicken, uh, anything in the freezer actually. He'd just get it and just eat it. He wouldn't even wait for it to def defrost. He'd eat it frozen. How? I don't know. James Papadopoulos was the youngest of three children. Born in Melbourne, he was 12 when he was diagnosed with prader willi syndrome. Zoe is his mum. He was a happy child until after he was diagnosed. Then he started becoming angry. Unfortunately, because he was diagnosed so late in life, we could not put locks on the fridges, could not put locks on pantries. We did put a lock once, but he just took the bolt cutters and just cut it off. It's a horrible disorder because they live and breathe only for food, how to get the next meal, how to get the next piece of fruit or anything. Their mind is only on food. Nothing else matters in life. Food. 
James's father was his best friend. But in 2009, his dad died suddenly. The grief was too much for James. At the age of 22, he made the decision to eat himself to death. Life to him meant nothing now. Without his dad, he, he adored his dad. His dad adored him. Now he didn't have his dad. He wanted to be with his dad. He was on a mission. And it took him two years, four months and 12 days to accomplish that. He refused help. He didn't want any medical attention. He just told the ambulance people to go home. Leave me alone. Prior to him passing, he had put on probably about, I know it's going to sound awful, 40 kilos in about 10 days. Did you try to stop him? No. That's what he wanted. I've stopped him all, all my life I've been stopping him. It was time he got his way. That's what he wanted. I'm not happy that's what he wanted, but he was happy. Answering system is on. Hi, this is James and Zoe Papadopoulos. We're not here at the moment to take a call. James died last October from a cardiac arrest. He was 25 years old and 160 kilos. In Australia, he was without help. In Britain, it's a different story. My parents said, uh, we don't want you to die. And so they sent you here. How long have you been here? For, for 10 years now. And how long do you intend to stay? For the rest of my life. This extraordinary facility is one of nine scattered across the UK. They're called Gretton Homes. Here, they've discovered a way to help. A radical approach to extreme weight loss for those with this extreme condition. How many people live in this house? 17 people with PWS. What are some of the most touching things they've said to you? You've saved my life. That's been a really, and that was really heartfelt. If I hadn't come here, I'd have died. You've saved my life. And I'm gonna cry now, so stop it. <laughs> it does, it, oh, it brings a tear to your eye, that does. Those who want to cheat the system find it almost impossible to do so. Anywhere there's food, there's padlocks. Basically, have to keep the um, bins locked up with a combination key um, because they would actually go through the bins and search for um, food. To what extent will they go to to get food? Um, some people will eat inappropriate, inedible things. Other people will food seek after meals. So if there's a crumb on the floor, they'll try and pick it up. Do you see it as sad? Or? They just can't help it. That overwhelming desire to food seek is there and there's nothing they can do to stop it. And yeah, it is quite sad. I love food. You love food? Yeah. What are your favourite foods? Uh, spaghetti bolognese. Spaghetti yeah. bolognese. The staff use psychology to outsmart the disorder. They overload the plates with low calorie foods like vegetables. It looks like a lot, but it's not. But not everyone is fooled. Some people will accept it to start with and then start to challenge the service. Other people will come and challenge it from day one. Yeah. No, so yeah. could you leave the kitchen for me? Oh, you come to wait out. We yeah, can't have too many residents in here. Yeah. Yeah. Rules is rules. You're going to come out? It's not rules. It is in here, sweetheart. Please don't ask staff for extra food while you're here, because you'll not. you won't get it. To save her from herself, Katie Williams was brought to a Gretton home by her parents. They hoped she'd adjust to the rules. While you're with us, you need to try and work to the same regime as what we do, OK? I can't. So you don't even think you can manage for 24 hours? She was only in Gretton homes for one night. She screamed and she shouted and she had a full-blown temper tantrum like a two-year-old. I said it was like a prison cell and it is like a prison cell. I'm 
it's similar to going through cold turkey with a heroin addict, I would imagine. So, yeah, it's very difficult. But it does work. This is Letitia Brown 10 years ago. This is Letitia today. I was 167 kilo. And now? And now I'm 65 kilos. So you've lost over 100 kilos? 100 kilos, yeah. I've lost 100 kilos. All right. Yeah. Residents are weighed weekly to monitor their progress. 37-year-old Letitia is one of their biggest losers. Ten stone four. Thank you. Well done, Letitia. You've lost a pound. Well done. How do you feel? Wonderful. I'm able to see myself in the mirror and I feel good. The secret to this place is that to save your life, you have to make a lifelong commitment. Does it upset you that your sister is almost held under lock and key? No. <laughs> no, because I've lived with her being in an environment that is very loose. Morning, Tish. You know, freedom is almost more of a jailer. What is it for breakfast? Alpine porridge this morning. All right, I'll see you when you come down. Yeah. Letitia had no life. Letitia has a life, that's how I see it. Colette Brown is Letitia's older sister. Hi, sis. All right, I'm fine, how are you? Letitia sees her family once a month. I'm really looking forward to seeing my sister. I haven't seen her for a long while. I've been going shopping and maybe the cinema. Do you think she'll be impressed? With how much weight you've lost? Yes, yeah, probably say, wow, look at you, you look fabulous. Do you remember the first words that you said to her when you saw her for the first time? <laughs> look at you, girlfriend. I think I was just, you know, it was just such an exciting moment to see this achievement. How much have you lost now? I'm 10 four now. 10 four, that is fantastic. New dress. Yeah. Every reunion is a chance nice. to show off. Very nice. It's nice going out clothes shopping now. Because yeah. I can get into clothes she can't. <laughs> Tisha, you're looking beautiful. So proud. Fantastic. If you could say something to her. Oh, God. <laughs> What would you want to say? <laughs> Just that I love her. <laughs> People think they're fat, they're ugly, they're unlovable. But as the weight comes off and lots of praise and lots of support from the staff, the self-esteem does rise and they see themselves as a part of a community. Yay! Me too now. A room at Gretton is not cheap. Around $3,000 a week which is covered by the UK government. In Australia, there's hardly any support. And the cost could not be higher. Just every day, listening to your son say, Mum, I want to die. I want to go. I don't want to live. That was heart-wrenching. What did you say to him? <laughs> Before he passed away. I 
I asked for his forgiveness in bringing me to this world. I felt it was my fault. Sad to say. You know it's not your fault. I know it's not my fault, but I felt like it was. It's extremely brave for you to share your story. Yeah, but people need to know how hard it is and how much these children do need help and they do need somewhere to go. If there was proper care available in Australia, do you think James would still be alive today? I think so. He's back in his dad's arms, just where he wanted to be. And I'm hoping he's eating everything in sight.